Aloha and welcome to the State of the State of Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii live streaming network series. Think Tech Hawaii broadcasts from our downtown studio at 1164 Bishop Street in the core of Honolulu's district. I'm host, I'm your host, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and I have a special guest to bring to our interview today. As you know, the election season is upon us and uh, uh, in, in the state of Hawaii as it is nationally. And my special guest today to tell us more about how she is making her case on the campaign trail for one of Hawaii's high executive offices. I'm pleased to introduce council member Kimberly Pine, who is remotely connected to Think Tech Hawaii to talk about her campaign uh, for the office of mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. Council member Pine is an experienced campaigner and has shown herself to be a winner. She now serves as a member of the Honolulu City Council from District 1, and she's in her second four-year term. Her experience includes serving as vice chair of the city council and chair of the council committee on zoning and housing. Previously, she served four terms in the Hawaii State House of Representatives for the communities of District 1, like Eva Beach, Iroquois Point, Kapolei, and Pualoa, and others on the Leeward Coast. In the House, her colleagues selected her to be House Minority Floor Leader. So in these roles, uh, Council Member Pine has achieved a record of numerous outcomes directly benefiting Hawaii citizens' quality of life as well as tourist quality of visit to Hawaii. So welcome, Council Member Pine, and thank you for joining us today for this interview conversation. Aloha, Stephanie, and to all of your viewers. Oh, good, good to see you. Um, very glad you could join us and we have some questions uh, to stimulate our conversation over what you're experiencing now and uh, we'd love to know a lot more about your goals and your process for achieving them. So clearly as an elected official you have succeeded many times on the campaign trail but this is your first mayoral run. And it may be that you are fulfilling your long-held aspiration, or you've had an epiphany, but would you share some about what made you decide to, to become the mayor, to go for being mayor of the city and county of Honolulu? Well, I guess I would say that uh, I've had a numerous epiphanies because I never dreamed that I'd be a politician or run for office. I like how you call it, you say it's an epiphany <laughs> because uh, when I first ran for the House of Representatives, it really was seeing my community being neglected and not being taken care of. We were last in terms of having traffic relief funding. We were last in the state for having school funding, last in the state for having uh, our police uh, funded and other things that are just needed for success in daily life. And so that's when I ran for office in the House of Representatives because I was supposed to be a news broadcaster. That's my training. And we weren't supposed to win. Uh, I ran against a powerful incumbent who was awful, also uh, president of a very powerful union in, in Abba Beach at the time. And so we just really ran to make a statement to get people involved in their government and to push the incumbent to work harder for the people and stop hanging out at the Capitol and really look at the problems of the community. And so when we, we ran in 2004 for the House of Representatives, we were very surprised to not just win, but we won by a landslide. And it had never been done before to an incumbent uh, like that. And, and then of course, I, I guess you could say I had an epiphany again, as you say, uh, when I ran for city council in 2012, it's because the incumbent at the time was also not taking care of our district. He was arguing a lot with a lot of people that we needed help from. Uh, he didn't accomplish much at the time. And so I ran again to get him back in, you know, you, you need to 
start working for the people. And we were very surprised that we, we won by a landslide on that election also. And I really truly was going to retire. The city council was going to be my last thing to do. And because I, I have been a horrible military spouse, <laughs> my poor husband, you know, I, I, I don't show up to all the things I'm supposed to, and he's been so lovely and wonderful. And I don't follow him when he is stationed somewhere else because of my service. But I really felt that I could do a better job you know, as mayor. As people who were talking about running, there's a lot of old names just being rehashed to another position. I felt that these last seven years that uh, there's been a lot of introduction of all these projects that were beautiful, wonderful, nice to have things when a lot of the necessary things that people needed, like more police officers, uh, safer streets, uh, better streets, better parks and beaches, more, more lifeguards, all these basic things that you need to have a good city was being neglected. And so that's why I decided to run and my family and I talked and, and they agree. They, they, they agree that there's so many problems that can be fixed if someone has the heart to listen to the people and understand their suffering. Well, let's talk about the campaign a little bit. You've, your service um, seems directed uh, to, to the felt, the seen um, needs of the community. And you, you seem to, you, you're looking at, at that as your resource for guiding y your work. Um, I, you've, you've referred to your campaign as an aggressive grassroots campaign. So it, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about what that means to those of us who haven't campaigned or helped in campaigns. Sorry about that, but, <laughs> but I'd really like to know more about what that, that means, an aggressive grassroots campaign? How does that work and how is that different from an ordinary campaign? Well, I think an ordinary campaign, what I've discovered in, in my position and running for this position as well, is there is a core group of very powerful people here in the state of Hawaii. They're the group that, that, that smokes the cigars in the back room and drinks their whiskey and says, okay, who are you going to put in the mayor's office? Who are we going to put in the governor's office? And, and then they get all their fundraisers together and their people together and their extended business networks together and, and say, okay, we're going to help this person. And I've never been that candidate. I've always been the one that no one can understand because I don't run in those groups. I, I come from a working class background and I hang out with working class People, just regular people. And so what I mean by an aggressive grassroots campaign, it's something that I've always done. And that is you first put your power base in the people because they're your boss. You need to listen to the people and recruit people that will help you in your mission to get people that put people, you know, at the top of their list and their needs first back into government. And so that's what I mean by an aggressive grassroots campaign is we believe that the number one place at the top is really towards the bottom. And so we're very excited to have 500 volunteers that are ready to go and people wanted to sign wave six months ago and, and I said no we've got to pace ourselves and so what people are doing is they're registering friends and family, they're making sure people vote in this election, we have people all over that are putting signs everywhere at this moment. We're just very very blessed to uh, have that kind of campaign going on right now. Well, it sounds like you've been practicing this in your in your campaigns um, and and probably in your service as well. And so you you've learned a lot about how that works. And I it sounds like you're really ramping that up in in this aggressive grassroots campaign. But I also want to know if the campaigning now this time for the mayor the mayor's office. Is that, um, does that become a category of its own and present a daunting challenge that's different from the other offices you've run for? How, how does, how is that all working for you now with what you already know and do well, obviously, and succeed with, and now you're looking at this, this high executive uh, office, third highest in the state. So what, what do you do about thinking with that? 
going it, on. It really is the core of, of the campaign. It's just like my, my smallest campaign in the House of Representatives. The core is always the same. You just need more people and more money and uh, more media time. And that's the only difference I would say in this campaign. Everything's just bigger and harder and you have to work longer hours. But the core of a good campaign comes from that grassroots level where you really listen to the people and you inspire the people to bring change to government. Well, do you think that this is on notice? Do you think that those, um, as you described them, cigar smokers in the back room, which is a very big tradition in traditional mm -hmm. politics, right? Do they notice this? And do, and do people notice that this is different? Is that what you're experiencing? They're, they're certainly noticing it. Um, they saw that we were able to raise just as much money as their guy, <laughs> but uh, we didn't do it all one time. You know, I don't have millionaire friends and I'm not a millionaire, but we competed with the best and we're, our, my team is very proud of that. It's a lot of hard work. Um, I think they were very surprised that we actually raised more money than them. And, uh, but it's a great inspiration to the people in my team where they can see that you can compete with people that are very powerful if you have the heart and you truly believe in what you're doing and you love what you're doing. So to my team, we're very inspired by what we're seeing. And, and I have the blessing uh, to be the leader of this movement. But my goal is that we have more candidates out there and I'm encouraging more candidates to run that also wants to change the system and, and end the system where just a few people that make a lot of money get someone in power so they can make more money. We have to stop that system. Well, then how does this, and, and you're not the mayor or, or have been the mayor um, yet, but how does this work forecast what your work will look like in the mayor's office. So if when you make the leap, when you win the election and you go into this powerful position with many other affordances, then maybe you, we even know now, but also with impediments and constraints. But have you, what is it gonna look like? How, how is what you're doing now forecasting what that's gonna look like knowing that you're in a different context or or are you? Anyway, could you talk a little bit about that? Please? I think that it shows, because we're doing so well, it shows that it is possible to elect a mayor or a politician at a very high level that is going to be putting the people first and listening to the people. I think we've seen a lot of things happening, like Sherwood Forest, for example, a government not listening to the people who live in that area, who should know that district better than anything else. I think it's an example of what I would have done on the Alawai issue, where you had seven neighborhood boards protesting, uh, tearing down their neighborhoods to put up six foot walls for, to prevent flooding in the Alawai when they had uh, engineers and architects step forward with a totally different plan than governments in Washington DC had that had the same effect to prevent flooding uh, I would not be a mayor that would say, I'm sorry, you're just little people, you don't know what you're doing, so we're going to do what um, these big contractors say. I think this shows the kind of mayor that I would be in listening to the people and believing in the people and their own talent and not uh, wealthy uh, contractors and people in power who are really just making decisions for their own pocketbook, not for the benefit of the people. And, uh, and a hopeful change. But when you get into the bigger picture, I was gonna ask now, what are, what are your strategies gonna be like to manage these daunting goals in your portfolio? You haven't been shy about setting up your list of, of priorities. It's the hard, complicated, homeless and uh, you know and, and government transparency and crime and um, our roads and beaches and beautification and all all of those really important issues so when you get into that situation where you have the affordances of a mayorship then what are you going to do about having to to shift priorities and what how are you going to manage 
to guide your um, your strategies for implementing what you want, given the the more complicated and numerous forces that are going to be at work on you, if that makes any sense at all. But anyway, it, in that in that arena, how do you see what you've already done and what you're doing play mm -hmm. out, and how is that going to help you with uh, the strategic nature of that responsibility there? Well, we certainly have a lot of goals and things that we want to get done. We shouldn't be 300 police officers short in the state of Hawaii and having grandmas getting robbed at bus stops. That's just unacceptable, and that's not the cities that we should be living in. Uh, a lot of these things, of course, that you were saying earlier, does cost money. But I've proposed numerous things that would allow us to increase our revenue without raising taxes. It took me two years to pass the city sponsorship bill with, with now uh, a bill that could be supported by people uh, that care about the environment. And what that did was other cities across the nation, across the world are teaming up with nonprofits, teaming up with donors, uh, endowments, to fix up parks and beaches, for example. And all that we were gonna give them is a small little sponsorship recognition and then it blended into the environment. It wasn't neon flashing, it was very respectable. Some of it would be in, you know, in maybe plaques or things like that along roads. Uh, it took me two years to pass that because there was some opposition to commercialize, commercializing um, Honolulu. But I think the final bill showed that we can blend that recognition into to the environment that it would be in. But it's been two years since it's passed and um, the administration hasn't implemented the bill yet. I have so many people that want to help and give money without raising taxes on the rest of the population. Some cities are raising as much as $300 million, which is far more uh, money that we need for many things in the city. Uh, the other thing that I proposed recently was um, how we deal with homeless. Right now, we're, we're spending 10, 15 to $20 million a year in handling the homeless issue. Uh, the administration proposed to sit lie bill legislation, and I was against that from the very beginning, because what that I predicted at the time, and that was six years ago, seven years ago, was that we're just moving people from one street to the next street. So how does that solve the homeless problem? And so unfortunately, six years um, you know, into it, they realized that I was right, that we were spending so much time really just cleaning up people's trash and then moving them from one town to the next town and causing major ha havoc in the next town. And then we'd spend even more money and more money and more money to handle the in increased um, negative psychological behavior that that caused people that already had some mental health issues called the stress of having them lose their stuff and then move them around. So all that money from 15 to $20 million that we have spent you know, a year, we could have used to put you know, affordable housing in, in certain places or partner it up with other organizations to rapidly build affordable housing. And we would have had a better result and actually ended their homelessness by having wraparound services uh, in terms of helping them with their mental health issues, their drug addictions, other things. So yes, I do have a lot of goals, but I've already shown that you can pay for things. We uh, passed in the TOD areas, uh, uh, housing developments that I required to have a very high number of affordable housing in it. And I didn't let anything go through my committee unless it had high affordable housing numbers. But each of those buildings brought in five to $10 million in property tax revenue a year in addition to what we already had. And so we passed about 10 of those buildings. So that brings in another $100 million to the city. So there's ways that you can uh, raise funds for the city and be more efficient with your funding uh, without raising taxes. And so there's just a few ideas that I had. There's many more, but I know we only have a half an hour. Well, I'm, uh, I, I'm pleased you brought that up because um, that seems uh, to be our life and that's that there's never enough money to do the things even mm -hmm. when we know and have the will and the political will to do them. There's just never enough money. So talking about the but your budget in that way, managing it so that you're using it to leverage more funds. And in a project, something like 
uh, your involvement with the Kaha Wiki Village, where I noted mm -hmm. that there was what you briefly re re referred to was a, a partnering of the state, the city and county, and the foundation, AIO. Mm -hmm. And I wondered uh, if that was uh, something you would tell us a little more about, because as you're saying it, you're using the funds to leverage more funds, because no matter how big your budget, and Honolulu's budget, budget as I understand it, is big. It's a, over a billion, but there's never enough. So how is it that you can, how is that an example or not, or uh, suggesting other things that you're thinking about doing that can make that difference? And it's a great example of a public-private partnership that helped to solve the homeless problem for certain income populations and especially for families. And it didn't take uh, too much city money, but it did take resources and it did take state resources and it took private investment and donations. And we are doing a sim two similar projects. Uh, I'm for the, the, the small tiny house program in villages. And we're gonna have two, one in Waianae with Twinkles, uh, there's a homeless encampment at, at the at the Waianae Boat Harbor, and we're also going to have one in Kailua next to the U.S. Vet Shelter. And how we're putting that together is also public-private partnership, where we have private companies donating the materials for the tiny houses. We are going to have the city donating uh, uh, portable uh, showers and and hygiene centers, so that once the, the nonprofits get enough money for the infrastructure, we can go to the next encampment and help them. And so really a lot of partnership is really the solution to a successful government. Government can't do things alone. You just don't have a tax base to do it alone. That's uh, the important point. And, and I show, I'm, I'm sure you'll be learning more about that going forward. Um, so I, I understand from the reports that one of the issues of houselessness that might that's part of the cause is that there isn't affordable housing permanent affordable housing mm -hmm. so you're going at that piece of it that seems to be um one remedy area to to work on so um that is not especially in the city council actually uh, seven years ago i said we must focus on affordable housing in a very big way we need to have city state private sector partnership. And you know what some people told me in politics? They said, Kim, it's not on a poll. No one's saying that it's important to them on a poll. But you see, I represent some of the poorest residents on Oahu. So we see things first. And I saw every week a new family either moving to Vegas or becoming homeless, living in their cars. People you never thought that would happen to, but they were living at, 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 at a tight paycheck to Egypt, that just one accident, one family member getting ill, they were homeless. And so now, what is everyone talking about affordable housing? And so this is why I started this many, many years ago. And we put the first affordable housing legislation together, where now, for the first time in history, if you're going to build on Oahu, if you have 10 units or more, you have to include affordable housing in your project. And the city will help you to do that by helping you have a little bit more density so that you can sell off some units to pay for the affordable housing. We'll give you less setbacks when you build affordable housing. We'll give you waivers on, on fees if you build mm -hmm. affordable housing. So we really finally got that right formula for that both the builders and, and the for, uh, affordable housing community were, was advocating for it. First, they were very divided. The original bill actually was going to destroy our economy, and then we were able to fix it and negotiate with all these different stakeholders to find legislation that they actually believe would actually build affordable housing. So we have about gosh, three to four thousand units that we know that are going to come up very soon. And uh, you're talking here about the big guns. You're talking about anyone who's building on Oahu. Yes, correct. Yes, Including anyone who builds ten units or more. Uh -huh. Yes. 10 yes, units that or was more. a really it, big mistake in Kaka'ako is they used state money, hundreds of millions of dollars to put in the infrastructure and they didn't demand enough affordable housing. Mm -hmm, it's a really mm -hmm, sad thing. Mm -hmm, really tough, yeah. Well, I, um, I think that um, 
There's another resource in Hawaii, but in my naivete, I, 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 and maybe, and my research has not been very deep on it, but lots of the homeless population are, um, have other agencies that support them for other things. And I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. other entities, nonprofits or, or uh, trusts, are they putting in enough to represent the, the portion of that population that, that really is in their kuleana, so to speak? So where these other big pots of money are, are they um, do paying their reasonable part? Contributing to it, I, I think that city? government is government, and perhaps maybe the private sector too uh, is not doing enough to help in the mental health area, in the drug addiction area, in the mental health uh, arena. We have fallen far behind where we were in the 80s, where I believe there was enough investment from the government sector to ensure we had enough hospitals, to ensure we had enough psychiatrists and, and mental health professionals. Uh, I can definitely tell you uh, that's mixed with drug addiction and God forbid if you were a construction worker, which I'm finding a lot of people right now who got injured on the job and have pain and mental health issues, most likely they're homeless. Uh, we don't have, until recently, we're, I've been working with Josh Green and Dr. Miskovic. He's the first doctor that believes we finally come, have come up with a medical formula to help those people who have both pain drug addiction and mental health issues by giving a, a, there's a new pain drug and I'm forgetting the name right now, that does not make you addictive. Oxycontin is what hold on, or, uh, was pushed yeah. on a lot of these people, yeah. these construction yeah. workers. Oh, yeah. So Hawaii's many got of its them fair share. Themselves. Yeah, that's yeah. really very, very yeah. sad. And uh, also what the problem with this is um, the state has not spent enough money on our inspection, inspections at the ports. Oh, and you yes. can see that on New Year's mm -hmm. Eve of mm -hmm. uh, almost every illegal firework was like every other house. Yes, right. <laughs> so, so, so you goes. can imagine if that's yeah. getting in, that's how the drugs are getting in. So we have a lot of weaknesses in certain areas. Well, Kim, it sounds uh, like you're more aware of those. Uh, you acknowledge them and you're obviously aware of them and we'll uh, be thinking about how to approach that issue and um, make things better in that area. But we're just about out of time, and so we'll have to wrap it up. So I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This is the State of the State of Hawaii on the Think Take Live Streaming Network series. We've been talking remotely with Council Member Kimberly Pine about making her case to be Honolulu's city and county mayor. I'll see you again in two weeks on the next State of the State of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention, Aloha. everyone. Thank you.